right. Welcome to another exciting episode of Fight Insight, the podcast that brings you all the latest news, updates, and analysis from the mixed martial arts world. I'm your co-host for the day, Michael Courier, BJJ Black Belt. What, what and, happened? And me? No, I'm just pointing at you because oh, you're I the guy. You were telling me to do something different. <laughs> ah, shit. <laughs> no, no, keep going. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm your co-host for the day, Michael Courier, BJJ Black Belt. Uh, owner of Gentleman's Fight Club and a former guest on the show. Um, today, we break down a language barrier, reveal Timmy B's perfect judging fix, and a whole lot more. Tim, hit it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Fight Insight Podcast. Let's talk. All right, our guest today was born in Moscow, immigrated to Israel, fights out of London, England with the great people over at GB Top Team. A ballet dancer, a gymnast, a model, a wife, and a mother, this bantamweight MMA fighter has competed around the world, racking up a record of 9-3, and three, most recently at Invicta 53 a few weeks ago with the first ever buggy choke submission in promotional history. Everybody... Do not adjust your television sets. This is not Kate Batchik. This is her twin. Her name, Big Bad, Olga Rubin. <laughs> you killed me with the last one. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing, Olga? I'm good. I'm good. good Back to same you. old routine. Same old routine. Just, just living life. You're out in Israel right now. Yep. I'm that currently is- sitting in my uh, bedroom trying to avoid the... Uh, Uh, My kid (laughs) bursting in. (laughs) No worries. No worries. Uh, (laughs) And uh, I do want to say thank you to Michael Courier for joining us as my co-host today. Olga, I met Michael almost two years ago, I think, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, right when I began doing this podcast just for fun. Didn't think it would last much more than 10 episodes. Uh, Michael was famous for being in combat jujitsu. And he came on our podcast, and he's been such a cool dude ever since, man. So, Michael, it's great to have you back. Thank you. I'm not saying that your success is due to me, but... It it really you know, is. I'm yeah. Just yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now my success is going to be from having Olga Rubin on the podcast. Olga, uh, first ever buggy choke submission in Invicta history. But it's, um, I mean... Yeah, I think in female uh, MMA in women's MMA overall. Women's MMA ever? Like all women's MMA? From what I heard, yeah. Holy moly, that is crazy. When you pulled off that victory, and I'm a big fan of Invicta. Like I really do like the Invicta League. I like uh, everything that they do. Every time we have a female fighter, they always uh, are so complimentary about Invicta because of what they do for women's sport, right? But when you pulled off that buggy choke, I had no clue what the hell you were doing. I don't know that anybody knew. I Googled buggy choke, and this is the photo I get. Oh, my days. No. (laughs) But that's how I look most of the time. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Um, Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. How the hell did you do that, Olga? First of all, I hit it all the time during training on almost everyone. So anyone who ever trained with me knows I can pull it off uh, 100%. Um, yeah, so I, it was about like the first time I tried it was for Octagon. I had a fight there and I I almost submitted her, but it took like 12, uh, 20 seconds out of the last, uh, first round. So I couldn't finish it. And then I tried it again against Tanisha Tannen, but I was in, um, in half guard. So I couldn't really pull it off, although I tried to do it a couple of times during training. Um, and then uh, I really believed in it and I hate it. Is, is, the, is the thing that like just people don't realize that's being set up? Like they just don't I think the judge didn't doing... know what it was. Yeah. I think the audience didn't know what it was. I think most of the audience didn't understand what was going on. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's a nasty one. Yeah. And I mean, Michael, because you're a jujitsu expert yourself, is this something that like when someone's starting to apply it to you from the bottom, mind you, they just don't realize the trouble they're in until it's too late? Yeah. You know, I've spent a lot of time with the buggy choke. I worked with uh, Renee Sosa, like the buggy choke master, uh, a bunch, and we've kind of shared ideas. I've actually taught seminars on the buggy choke in Europe. And um, it works because it comes from a historically inferior position. 
And so, um, but it's one of those things like anything else, when you know it exists, it becomes easier to defend. But um, people tend to get to that chest to chest connection, uh, either in cross sides or in half guard, and they feel pretty safe because they're kind of in a dominant pin. Um, that's where it becomes so dominant for the bottom player because you're taking advantage of a person's uh, relative safe feeling. And so, but it's not safe at all. Yeah, not if you're fighting Olga Rubin. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Olga. I think, I think I just hit it so many times in training, like so many times every day. It's like second nature to me. If I'm in every position and bottom, I know what to do from there because I've been in those positions every day. So it's only a matter of like muscle reaction and being flexible enough to pull it off. And I think that like the, the big thing you mentioned was being in half guard too, because, um, you know, we historically saw it from a cross size position. Um, this is a great clip. Uh, a good friend of mine, Jordan Macy, at the ADCC West Coast trials getting knocked out. He got slammed uh, from a cross body position. Uh, when you apply the half guard, you hook the bottom leg you kind of really defeat the slams. And so it makes it a much safer technique to do when you're looking at MMA or like an ADCC rule set. So that's huge. I mean, I mean, that was my first question for you was, um, are you looking for this from a crossbody position or strictly from a half guard? The thing is that sometimes uh, some people just tend to get overexcited to pass the guard. So they kind of give the position to you. So sometimes I lead them towards it and close it in a in a cross side but uh with that said i also finished it from uh ha bottom half guard uh many times not during the fight unfortunately but still um okay. but yeah it's it's just a matter of try 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 and error <laughs> no it's amazing olga um you know i feel like you're gonna be the next alexander olenek who was always finishing people with the Ezekiel choke Right. Like if yeah. you pull this off a couple more times, you're the you are the buggy choke person. You know what I mean? You'll be known as that. Uh, you may have to change your nickname from Big Bad <laughs> Olga Rugen to Big Bad Buggy. buggy choke. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Big Bad Buggy. Big Bad yeah. Buggy. Yeah, yeah. I've heard it before. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so I did want to give a shout out. Oh, actually, before we get to it, you won the punch gunk performance of the night at Invicta. So that was pretty cool. Does that was that, really cool. Does that mean uh, money? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, nice, nice, good. Okay, they didn't say yeah. that it was like a monetary prize, but okay, good. So you got a little bit extra cash in the pocket. So that's yeah, awesome. It, it was nice to be acknowledged. Um, you know, the, the fight was uh, was a really good fight for me. Uh, I knew Claire is a really tough opponent. She's gonna storm in. She's gonna. Uh, put so much pressure on me, which she did. And her game plan was kind of working until she was so excited that I tried to pull off the trip and I fell. Um, and she was so excited, so she just gave it to me. But up to that point, I'm pretty sure she was up the scorecards and she was grinding me against the, the wall. So I just had to make sure either I finish her or I'm like, I'm going to be in trouble. Yeah. So and it was I, a very yeah, good and fight. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was a good fight. It was a good matchup. You know, Claire Guthrie, I do love her. I do hope that I get her on the podcast one day because she's a very uh, likable individual. We've had people that she trains with who love her and say that nothing but the nicest things. Um, so it was a big Let profile. me just say that as her opponent, it was really hard finding something bad about her. She's so bubbly and cute and you just want to hug her and then you need to punch her it was hard but yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah no she seems like such a nice person actually so that was going to be my question you know oftentimes i do find that in women's mixed martial arts the the girls can get quite aggressive with one another before and after knowing what a nice person you are and i've heard such great things about you and then knowing what a great person claire is were you guys friendly after at all or is there any we were friendly after we were friendly before as well there is no bad um you know bad vibes at all like you said sometimes you vibe with the person you know you need to get into work tomorrow and try to kill each other but it doesn't mean like he's not likable it's just business we're yeah. in a violent business and you kind of need to switch on and off it's it's how it goes like i never saw the the reason for like being aggressive during weigh-ins like if it's not you if it's not the person you are it's basically like yeah yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I got it. I actually and... told her like after the stare down and said like, 
oh, it's going to be like Yellowstone tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. thought it was really funny. <laughs> no, no, for sure. Grizzly uh, against the wolf. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I did want to say the, re the how I became uh, aware of Olga, Mike, is that we had her friend on who is her twin, not real twin, but everybody knows her as twin. It's Kate Batchick, Queen of the South. There's the two of oh, you there. Look when at you <laughs> uh, Question, what is the, uh, what is your favorite Kate Batchick story? Oh, I have so many of them. <laughs> the most embarrassing, maybe the you know something good for the listeners. Oh, I'm I'm should I, I'm not gonna spill beans. <laughs> <laughs> what? But let me just say that Kate Bachik is um, someone I vibed with from the first punch we threw at each other, which was a spinning back fist. The same time, both of them hit, and we looked at each other like Spider Man. You like. <laughs> Like, dude, we're going to be besties. And uh, we kind of vibed immediately. And it was like maybe, I don't know, seven, eight months ago. It's not something, uh, that, but, but you feel like you know the person for the entire life. Yeah. Nice, so that's nice. Cool. Yeah, it's awesome, you know, because at GB Top Team specifically, there's a big group of, of female fighters. Um, so really it looks like a fighting. really good environment. Now you're from Israel. Is uh, one of the questions we had from people submitting is 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 MMA big in Israel? Yes, it started to be uh, much bigger than it was. We have uh, about ten uh, active pro fighters um, just around the world. We have uh, my friend Itai Tratner who's going to fight in Madrid uh, this Saturday. Uh, we've got Elia Ronov uh, who's in. International 5 and 0. We got uh, Simon Smutritsky. We got Nathan Levy, Eli Barzi, like like guys that really paved the way for other Israelis to kind of join after them. Nice. So uh, yeah, it's really growing here. The IMAFs were really uh, picking up uh, awards. No, yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah. Is it possible that Fight in Sight becomes the number one MMA podcast in Israel? And how do I get that to happen? Uh, let's make this one interesting, I guess. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. We just need to get everyone on board. Um, so as the sport is becoming bigger there, as, as you are becoming more and more of a star, I do always like asking people, what is your end goal for this? Where would you like to end up? Where would you like to be champion? I always told myself, like, since I started it and I was watching Misha Tate and Ronda Rousey and Julie Kebdi, oh my God, she's commentating for Invicta right now, so I just can't even imagine, like, yeah. Um, so, like, I always kind of felt like I eventually want to be a champion in the UFC because this is the best of the best. And this is what I strive to be. I'm kind of perfectionist, I guess. And nothing is like good enough, and I constantly work and work and work just to um, get better. Yeah, to be for sure. Yeah, um, the reason I ask is because, of course, there's been all the news all over about what's happening with other organizations. Mike, I don't know if you heard there. There's been talks that PFL might buy out Bellator. And yeah, so yeah, I've heard the same thing, and so I think that you know, that was tricky because I think consolidation can be uh, a good thing. You know, it can really raise the level. Um, one of my biggest concerns I have with MMA is that lack of cross promotion fights. You know, I would love to see, um, you know, UFC fighting Bellator champions, that kind of stuff. So I think that when you combine, you kind of get that, um, all the benefits of that cross promotional fight, but you get it in one house. You know, it's just like, you know, the UFC has purchased multiple organizations and, uh, you know, many great fighters have come from those and then now became uh, very, very relevant in the UFC. So uh, I think it could be a good thing. Yeah. Uh, Olga, before I say my piece, what do you think if, if PFL were to buy Bellator? Do you like that? Do you not like it? Does it matter to you? I honestly don't know. I think, uh, I think it might be good for both promotional fighters, you know, um, just more exciting, you know, something yeah. more interesting happening. Like Bellator yeah. done with Ryzen, like every time they've done a champ versus champ, it was, that was big shows. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah maybe it works. <laughs> the only problem with the cross promotional, Mike and, and Olga, when Bellator did the one with Risen just recently, Bellator swept them. 
Yeah. So that but, is, I mean, that's always but, tough because then it's like, oh boy. Yeah, I mean, is it is it a problem or is it just this? Uh, I mean, th there's going to be a hierarchy always, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's important too. I mean, I look at it like I would love. Man, I think the perfect event for me would look like a wrestling meet where the UFC puts their best 35, 40, 555, um, all the weights against Bellator's best weights. We do one night where we have one match at each weight class and the best kind of team arises. You know, I think that'd be, it'd be really fun to watch. Um, we don't see a lot of team efforts in MMA. I mean, obviously, we, we, we train with our teams and oftentimes the MMA cards are built around three or four guys or girls from the same team. But I think it'd right. be really cool to see a real team versus team structure. And I think that a promotion versus promotion structure in that format could be wildly entertaining. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I guess my take on it, Olga, is as you are growing and, and you know, progressing in your career, I just like there to be more organizations because then it gives you more options. I worry that if PFL buys out Bellator, well, now that's just eliminated one bidding option for you. You know what I mean? Um, you know, because then you could play off multiple offers, I was thinking. Yeah, but eventually you can play a lot of offers, but you can fight only X much times per year, you know? Right, and right. I'm very happy with it, Victor. I fought um, already twice since January. So yeah. that's basically my main goal, to be very active. I don't like being sidelined at all. So the more... The more I fight, the better I get. I, I just can't sit on my ass and just wait for something to happen, you know? <laughs> no, no. And I literally uh, yeah. flew back and I came straight to the gym and I had like the full course of my uh, training. You know, it's like nothing happened. I have to work more. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, when, I don't know the reach of Invicta. It, were people in Israel able to watch you? Like they're able to see those fights? Yeah, unfortunately, every time I fight in America, it's really hard for my, my friends to actually wake up in the middle of the night and watch it. So, so many of them missed it, and I'm okay with it. I'm not mad, I swear. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm thankful for the ones who did, but it's, it's, so, it's normal. Yeah, yeah. Now, 3 a.m., uh, 5 a.m. Yeah, now we will talk as well. The news just dropped today that Francis Ngannou signs with PFL. Any thoughts on that, Olga? Are you excited about that? Do you care at all? Do you think it's good or bad? I know it sounds really bad, but I honestly don't care too much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so far up my own ass. Like, this is just like too, too much for me. He goes well, here, he goes there. He's asking for more money. I'm like, okay, cool. It's like, there are bigger things. <laughs> Yeah. Well, no, the only reason I'm saying is because part of the thing that he apparently um, negotiated in with signing with PFL is that uh, he will be somewhat of a fight, pro uh, a fight promoter, not promoter, but a fight. Uh, like an advocate. Yeah. Advocate for fighters in the PFL. So apparently if you sign on with the PFL one day, I think Francis Ngannou goes in and helps you sign the contract. That's a nice touch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least you can get a little photo op with Francis while you're signing your contract <laughs> and, you know, get a nice photo for Instagram. Yeah, it's always nice for fighters to kind of promote other fighters and, like, help other people grow. So that's a nice act, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mike, any thoughts on Francis? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think that... Uh, I think it's fantastic. I think that, like, you, you have to, you know as fighters or as as an artist or anything else you have to be stern in your value on yourself and i think that um one of the big problems we've always seen especially with the ufc is uh if they contact me for a fight they offer me five thousand dollars for a last minute fight then i say no there are a thousand kids who will do it for free who will undercut and they will do it for free and they'll take your spot because they want a chance and i think that um, it takes huge balls to say, listen, this is my value and yeah. I'm going to walk away from the belt. I'm going to walk away from the largest promotion in the world because I value myself. And it's a gamble because you may value yourself way higher than you're actually worth. 
right? Yeah. You may be that artist who never sells a painting because his paintings are worth too much or, or value too high. And so um, the market will always dictate your value. It's your job to be stern in what you think you deserve and hope that, that pays off. So I'm, I'm really hoping he got a great deal. It seems like it wasn't really a big financial issue. It was more a matter of he wanted to have roles in the company. And yeah. so uh, he is given this major role in all of the MMA in Africa. And so, yeah. um, you know, he, he does have these, these, he has four or five different roles outside of fighting. Um, and he's also allowed to box and do other cross promotional things. And so um, it's easy to say he should just sign the contract and fight for UFC. But you have to respect a man who's willing to give up everything to stand for yeah. his rights and for, for what he believes in. So uh, I have huge respect for him. I hope it all worked out really well. Yeah, I think that's the big thing. I think that's the big thing for young fighters. And Olga, I mean, you're nine, you know, you've fought 12 times in your career. So it's not like you're a young, young fighter, but uh, you are youthful and you do have your whole career ahead of you. But no, I think that that Francis Ngannou thing is great for, for other fighters to look to and go, yeah, hold on. If I hold firm to my values, you know, every person that does it now after this, it sets the stage and it encourages the next the next person to do it and the next person to do it, right? Like that's how we can raise the sport better and better by continuing to hold true to your value. So I like that. Olga. I agree with that. I agree with that. that that's the right thing for him because that's uh, something he feels strong about. Uh, that's something that he feels like he deserves and I'm, I'm happy for him he got it. And obviously it's good for other fighters as well. But for, for me, it's a matter of like, I, I just want to fight. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Olga's just out there just trying to murder people and get them in buggy chokes. That's all. Uh, Olga, uh, before I ask you one last question, I did want to say um, your Instagram is great. So I do want people to go and follow you on Instagram. You are at, I'm going to put it at the bottom of the screen here. It's at Olga underscore Ruben underscore MMA. That's you. Is that the best place to get a hold of you to check you out to see all your stuff? That's That's where you're most active on Instagram? Yes, that's what I'm most active. I just recently, like maybe less than a week ago, opened Twitter and I'm still in shock. <laughs> okay. I've, uh, yeah, I'm still trying to understand how it works, but um, yeah. No worries, no worries. There's a lot of, there's a lot of horrible people everywhere you go. Uh, oh, of course. Twitter is I'm, pretty I'm not... bad. Twitter, Twitter is pretty bad. What is your handle on Twitter? Do you know, just so we can say it out loud? I think it's uh, Big Bad 2.0. Oh, nice. Okay. Big Bad 2.0. So go follow you on Twitter. I'll, I'll find you after this podcast for sure. Um, is there anything that you wanted to say to fans, friends, viewers, or listeners of the podcast? Just, uh, just as like nothing is easy in life and sometimes you're having a bad day, but if you really believe in something um, and you really work hard for it, you just, it happens. Like, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, was fighting always your goal in life? Was that no, what you were destined to do? No? Uh, not until I was about 23 years old. That's when I started training and fighting. Uh, but since I started, yeah, that was my main goal. It kind of became a, a, an obsession. Uh, nice. Yeah. And, and your family was okay with it? They were okay with you making that switch? Uh, it, it was hard at first, but when I got pregnant, um, like I, I couldn't stop training. I was doing whatever I could, you know, with the situation. And my husband really respected that. And he's like, okay, she's really serious about that. Because <laughs> I used to drop so many, um, you know, uh, different hobbies I've tried for uh, one day before. And we've been through this so many times before. So I understand. But yeah, um, yeah it, I just couldn't stop. Nice. It's amazing. I mean, we're so excited to watch you. I, you know, you're such a great person. I, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Um, there's a question I've been asking my guests uh, in the last couple months, and I'd like to ask it to you before we go. Um, it's a question that my mother used to ask me as I was growing up. On a scale of one to 10, Olga Rubin, how happy are you? I'm a 10. 10? Yeah. Nice, nice. Uh, would you like to expand upon it or explain why? I'm just very fortunate um, to be doing what I love, being who I am, and having who I love like next to me. I've, you know, it's like I'm trying to always focus on everything that is good in my life. That's that's how I roll. 
Nice. That's amazing, Olga. No, I appreciate it. I think that's important for people to hear too, right? Focus on your happiness. Focus on the things that make you happy. I'm glad that you're surrounded by good people. Uh, you have tons of love and support. So when we posted that you were coming on the podcast, people were very excited to be able to hear from you and uh, to talk cool. to you. Yeah. So Olga, all the best to you. Can't wait to see you fight again soon. When do you think uh, the next fight will be? When are you hoping for? I'm ready for whatever. I'm just continuing training every day, um, improving, getting better. And hopefully I'll fight soon. Yeah. I mean, and, it's, free. and it's a title shot, right? Bantamweight title shot. Maybe. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I'm messaging Shannon Knapp every day saying, Olga Rubin, title shot. Let's make it happen. All right. Olga, thank you so much. Michael, is there anything you want to say before Thanks we go? Thanks for having me, guys. No, that was awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Olga. Have a good one. See Bye. ya. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Take care. All right. There she is, Mike. Cool. When I saw that buggy choke, man. Yeah. I had no clue what the hell that was. And I don't think anybody <laughs> did. <coughs> it's but pretty obscure, you know? I mean, it was, uh, it, it honestly, like, it. it's a year old. I mean, that's it. I mean, it, it's been around so short of a period of time. And uh, it's just kind of taken over. It, it's just, it's out of control. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. It's Yeah, it's just very interesting. It's such a crazy uh, move now. I did want to say for those that are on the podcast because of Olga Rubin, thank you so much. Um, thanks for joining us. Please do subscribe, follow whatever platform you're hearing us right now. Friends of the podcast update. I do want to say Rage Works Podcast Network. They're a New York podcast network. We're part of them. So thank you to them. Check them out for other podcasts. Uh, Ji Yeon Kim, Fire Fist, Ji Yeon Kim. She fought last weekend at UFC and all drama has broken out over this Ooh. one. You saw that one, Mike? Oh, yes. So Jiyeon Kim, she's friend of the podcast. Uh, she came on about maybe a little over a year ago. I was very happy to meet her. She gets into a fight where there's penalties, uh, points take multiple points taken away. The, you know, her opponent perhaps took an easy way out, you know. Um, and then there's been lots of jabber back and forth online. Jion Kim posts a long thing on her Instagram story talking about what happened and really laying in to uh, Mandy Boom. Mandy Boom responds, uh, Mike, I've got one thing that I need to get off my chest with this one, but you first, what did you see with that fight? Just interested. You know, I, I hate to say it, but I love it. Like, I love, I love the, like, you know, I, I'd like to see more points being uh, taken away. I think that uh, I want to see guys, you know, I think we're, we're, we're passionate, you know, we get out there and we have these things going on. And I think that um, I don't believe anybody goes into a fight hoping for an easy way out. That's not what I'm saying. I think that some guys know that, you know, hey, this are some people know that this is not going the way I want it to go. Here's my chance to get a reset maybe get a rematch now that I've kind of felt her a little bit and I can come in and reassess things. Uh, but I mean, I, I, I want to keep MMA sport, meaning I want guys to guys and girls to fight super hard in the octagon and then be out and be friends afterwards. Just like Olga said. Uh, yeah, but I'm still human and the drama still pulls me in. And so <laughs> it's like, you know, you, you, you're flipping through the channels and you get past this horrible reality TV show. You kind of stick around for a little bit. So, yeah. 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 Uh, I did watch the last season of love is blind Mike well, with my wife and I hated every moment of it. <laughs> it's so <laughs> terrible. I love it. But was I sitting there waiting for the finale? Damn right. I was Mike. I was uh, embarrassed all, every moment, but I did it. We're only human. Yeah. Uh, here's my problem, Mike. And it's not so much the points being taken away. It's all that it's because I love Gian Kim. Okay. Yeah. He, I'm going to show a quick little video. I hope YouTube does not take this out. It's going to show three segments of the fight. Uh, she comes to the cage with what appears to be her coach, which is uh, Coach Wood out of Syndicate MMA, longtime coach that she trains there. There's a couple other people. I think one of them is her brother who I'm told may not speak English. I don't think Jian Kim speaks English. 
Now, when she was on my podcast, she definitely did not. Maybe she can say a few things here and there, but I do not think she's able to like have a conversation fully. Okay. When between the rounds, when she's in her corner, Coach Wood comes in with nobody else, no translator around. And he's speaking to her. And you'll see in the video clip, she's not even really looking at him in the eye. And she seems to give no verbal nor nonverbal confirmation of what is being said or heard. You'll hear during the fight, I think it's Dominic Cruz. And I think that's the clip I have. Dominic Cruz goes, her corner's telling her what to do, but she's not listening. Yeah, because she doesn't speak English. <laughs> And then the third clip I'm going to show you, and it's all in one clip. Okay, it's quick. The third clip is where she's speaking to the ref because when the ref goes to take the point away or whatever and she starts speaking to him, I've listened to it a lot of times. I cannot understand what she's saying. <sighs> Meaning there's a language barrier. Okay, so I'm just going to play this one clip for you here. Uh, please, YouTube, do not take this down. Stop. Breathe. Hey, don't hold on. Hey. She goes deep here again. because Kim's coaches are saying, please don't do this, and she's doing it. Yeah, yeah coach, learn all this shit to get my anger. I mean, I kind of explained what we were seeing there, right? I put music over top and all that so it doesn't get pulled off, Mike. But you can go back and watch it. The fight was on UFC Fight Night. My big problem with this. I don't know why she had no translator with her for this yeah. fight. But I think that, like, you know, the, the UFC is a major organization. They have to do a better job of having bilingual referees in these fights. Okay. I like right? it. I mean, like, obviously, you know, I'm sorry. The Athletic Commission has to do a better job of making these guys available. And you'll see this with Spanish often, right? Like Mike Beltran. Yep. speaks perfect Spanish, and he will often use Spanish to Spanish-speaking fighters. And I think it's, it's how can you have a fight where you're trying to communicate both fighter to ref and ref to fighter, and there is such a strong language barrier there. It doesn't seem fair to either person, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it shouldn't be – we can't say it's on her to learn English, right? I mean, uh, the Ugh. reality is – well, the reality is – if you want to become a star in our sport, English is n completely necessary. Yeah. Right. And I think you'll see all the champions or all the fighters who don't speak English will always struggle with that. Yeah. Most of them are learning English. You know, uh, Jose Aldo did a really good job of getting enough English where he could at least you know give an interview and, and communicate well. Um, and I think that that really saw his market skyrocket. So, yeah. But we, we we have to at least meet him halfway. You know. And yeah. Uh, okay. If the commission is responsible, all they need to do even is just have someone on the outside, right? Okay, okay fine. Maybe yeah. you can't find a referee that's able to speak Kazakhstani and Korean, right? <laughs> like maybe that guy's hard to find, but right. have interpreters there or, well, no. So the commission has to do that, but yeah. I don't understand from what I could see, why Jeon Kim had no translator with her. And I don't know whether that's her or whether that's her coaching staff. Because ultimately, that is right now as it stands, that's on you to have that. Yes, yes. Um, and, I, so and, I, and I just feel, because Mike, you know, she's in these grappling positions that now, she, you know, post-fight, she said that she had injuries to her knee and all that. So that's why um, she had the knee braces on and blah, blah. And that's why she followed her to the ground. But okay, Jeon Kim is not... A, a big jujitsu expert. Um, and then when she's down on the ground, and I don't know that Coach Wood is either, to be fair, but she's down on the ground. That's the main time people need to scream instructions to you for you to understand. Mike, have you ever coached someone who does not understand English? Yeah, I mean, so I, I spend most of my time teaching in Europe. No, 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 no but coaching during a fight. Uh, during a fight, uh, during like a jitsu match, yes. Okay. Um, MMA fight. I've only coached in, in English to English speaking natives. And so, but I, I've, I've coached, I've, I've both received coaching and coached jujitsu in German and French. Okay. And uh, my German and French is not sound. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I, I can get by 
But I can tell you that typically the language of grappling is universal, right? And so uh, while I'm, in, and, and this is this is anecdotal, and this is me saying that um, if I'm in a class that the coach is speaking German, typically they still use English words for the jiu-jitsu terms, right? Oh, okay, okay, right. yeah. So but I'm not able to construct the whole sentence. I'm able no. to construct that he said half guard, or he said Kimura, or he said Ashigurami, right? Yeah. And so I would think that in in a fight where you have you know money on the line, uh, fame on the line, all this stuff, I think you typically see corners that are stacked with uh, you know a striking a striking coach, a grappling coach, uh, maybe like a, a close relative or like a, a boyfriend girlfriend something that can help communicate both emotions and uh, specific details to somebody. And so when you lose that by not having a specific grappling coach and then not having a translator, uh, I mean, how much is really getting through to somebody? I, I, I don't know. And it yeah. just frustrates me because I think that was now her fifth loss in a row maybe or something like that. So she's really on the chopping block of the UFC Yep. And I just don't know why that would have happened, why you'd be in that position to not have someone that speaks your language for all aspects. Because A, it's like you said, it's for when the referee shouting instructions at you or warnings, right? Are you even 100% understanding what's happening? Yeah. Um, and then in the corner and during the fight. And look, during the fight, this wasn't an apex fight. She's in a, a crowded arena in Charlotte that those the voices are coming at you all over the place oh, so yeah. you yeah. might not even be able to isolate your coach's voice so if in any way the language is difficult ah i'm so mad mike i'm yeah. so mad at this whole thing because i feel like it really screwed her up and i can't help but think that that is somewhat of a problem now i've been arguing with people online and they're like well she speaks english i'm like okay i had her on the podcast a year ago i know she didn't then Maybe she does, but I don't think I've ever seen anything to to prove that otherwise. I actually speak with her uh, somewhat frequently on Instagram, but she was even doing that before I had her on the podcast. So she's using something to translate. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Right. So yeah. she's using or some sort of program or whatever to translate and then to go back and forth with me in writing. And she's the most wonderful person. So when I'm saying all of this, I'm only saying this out of love. No, of course. No, of course. Nothing bad about her, but it's just like, Jeez Louise. And we've talked on this podcast before about the need for fighters to speak English. I mean, yeah. marketability and all that, even just understanding the sport as a whole, uh, you know, being able to travel the world and train such as yourself. I do think like, hey, whether the, the management teams or whatever, they've got to, you know, just set their fighters up with like English, yeah. like lessons, you know, like. I, I've done, let's see, I, I've taught seminars now in 12 countries. Um, I, it's very, very rare for me to meet someone who doesn't speak English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it yeah. really, I mean, because it's and, amazing. And, you know, it's I, amazing. I mean, it, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time going to these these uh, these camps for the Globe Trotters. Um, typically, at a camp, there's 200 students there for a week. Um, we usually see, you know, 10 to 15 different countries, maybe six, seven different languages. Every coach there coaches in English. You yeah. know, I mean, it really is like. It's becoming more and more the universal language, especially with mixed martial arts and grappling. Yeah. Um, it, it's important. I think. I think it's it just the obviously the largest market share is going to be English speakers, as far as uh, uh, watchers, viewers, purchasers, all that stuff. And so, uh, you're doing yourself a big disservice to not speak English at this point. Yeah. No. For sure. Um, but yeah, I don't even know where I want to go with this. But you know. God damn it. I'm just so pissed at that whole scenario. I feel like a lot of people online don't understand what the hell was going on. But I, I I don't know. It just bothered me with that. I don't know what the hell's happening. I do wish her the best, though, because she's a friend of the podcast. Of right. Course, of course. And so, of course, I always wish her the best. Um, kind of going off on that, there was the whole judging thing that happened there. And we've talked about it the last couple of weeks on the podcast where I said I would tell people my fix on judging. OK, how we can fix MMA judging. Mike, I'm going to reveal you it. Said, with... you, you said the perfect fix. Actually, yeah, it's... I said for you, the perfect fix. It is the perfect fix, Mike. <laughs> okay, here it is. Hold on. I'm just going to put this here. Fixes a judging. Okay, so that's what we're going to call the segment here. I didn't set this up. Timmy fixes judging. Mike, here's my fix, and then I want your comment. 
after every event, the judges must make them avail must avail themselves for media questions. I love it. That's it. That, like, no, right. I think that there has to be some sort of accountability. Yeah. Right. I think that, like, I mean, I, I am certain. I, I can't think of the the exact score off the top of my head, but there were several in the last five years where it everything looked like the judge just mixed the 10 and the nine up. Right, right, right. yeah. Like it was literally just a matter of they, they, they forgot the fighter's name and they, and they put the nine where it should have been a 10 and they flip flopped them and then the fight was decided. Maybe not decided, there, there was a, a split decision or something that was there because of that. And I think that uh, they cannot remain anonymous and just be these ghosts that allowed to do whatever they want and they walk and they go home and then they play golf. Like, yeah. no, they should yeah. be held accountable. Uh, there needs to be a more transparency in, in, in our scoring system. Uh, it's a huge issue. I can't think of the last fight card that didn't have some type of a controversy. Yep. Yeah. So, but here's the thing. So we've had Judge Mike Bell on the podcast, who was fantastic. Yeah. And he told us uh, some of the things I learned that the judges sit at different spots around the cage. They all don't sit together. They don't converse during during the fight so again i'm just recapping this for people that haven't seen that podcast episode but go watch it because he talks about some great stuff they sit on on different angles so they're seeing the fight from different angles he did say that most judges do train either in yeah. jiu-jitsu or mma so a lot of them opposed to, to popular belief they do train they do know what the hell they're talking about and looking at however as much as we know their names, and there's actually websites that you can go on that can show you judges' scorecards throughout yeah, yeah. history, you know? If the judges at the end of the event are mandated to go to that press conference and just sit there for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever the time zone is you want, and allow the media to ask questions, that's all I need in life, and I feel like judging will be fixed. Because either the judges will now say, shit, I'm going to have to be accountable when I give this 10-9 to Aljo instead of Cejudo in the fifth round where we all know Cejudo won. <laughs> I'm going to have to be trans. I'm going to have, I'm going to be questioned on that. So I better fucking know why I'm doing that. I sure. feel like that's going to improve the scoring there. And or people will begin to understand judging more. And they will go, oh, he explained he gave it to Aljo because of X, Y, Z. Sure. I think that like... Either I mean, way, we come together and we figure shit out. You know, as, as athletes, we have to know what we're being scored on. And we have to know what the measure of success is. I mean, if, you were, if we were playing basketball and there were different pointers all over the court, three-pointer, five-pointer, ten-pointer... And you didn't know where they were. At the end of the game, they, oh, you, you, know, you, you shot more baskets, but you lost the game because they were valued higher than yours. Yeah. You'd be furious. I mean, that, that wouldn't be a real sport. Yeah. You know? And so we are, we are in this weird realm of this is a combat fight sport, but it's still a sport, right? Yeah. We have to understand that there are scoring systems and rules to follow and strategy and and uh, uh, good coaching and proper use of that scoring system is hugely important. Yeah. And right now it's it's just so blind. I mean, we're we're lost on how we are winning fights or losing fights, and yeah. that's terrifying. You know, and it's really hard to make it. Uh, with with boxing, it's so simple because you have one element. You have strikes. Right. You have just hand strikes. Yeah. Right. And so it's it's pretty easy to quantify that. But yeah. if I've got a referee who is a lifetime grappler and a referee that's a lifetime kickboxer, well, maybe one's going to skew the grappling exchange that's heavier than the other, yeah. you know? And so I, I, I'm a grappler. If I take you down and hold you down for five minutes or for three minutes, I'm going to value that higher than you getting two good strikes on me. Right. But yeah. a striker's going to say, well, those strikes did damage and the grappling did no damage. So. Uh, but if we don't know, it, there, there's just so many inconsistencies and we're dealing with guys' lives and careers on the line based yeah. off of um, a very objective stance. Uh, yeah. It's very difficult.
very subjective stance. Sub subjective, yes. Of subjective, course. subjective. Yes. Yeah. 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 Now, yeah. Uh, I do want to say, just I'm gonna, yeah. So look, I fixed it. Okay. Done. Timmy, B, the Fight Insight podcast. We have fixed MMA judging. It's done. Implement yep. this tomorrow, and you will see results that day. Like I'm calling Dana right now. Do you mind? Because he has blocked me on Instagram. So Got just it. let him know. Uh, <laughs> I do. <laughs> Uh, before we get to our last uh, thing, I do, again, Mike, I really do want to thank you for coming up and, and showing up. Um, unfortunately, my my recent regular co-host, Brady Bunch, was unable to make it. Uh, Brady Bunch fought at uh, Rough and Rowdy last week and unfortunately lost the fight in a decision and is just taking some time off. So for those wondering where Brady Bunch is, um, you know, wish Brady Bunch well, go send love on Instagram, and I'm sure Brady Bunch will be back in the future. But I did put a call out for a, a co-host, and Mike, you answered the call, and I really appreciate it. I also did get some other fabulous uh, um, people saying that they would co-host as well. So I do just want to shout out, of course, Brian Bam Bam Barbarena, UFC fighter. He was quick to say he's ready to come on anytime. Uh, we just met her, Alana Cook, the Alanimal out of West Coast Canada. We had her on. She's a bantamweight fighter. She was saying she was going to come on. So, you know, I appreciate all the people and the love that I've got, um, like, from people like you, Mike. I really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Uh, so how the hell did I make the cut? You made the cut yeah. because... I must, uh, have been, I must have been bottom, bottom, bottom tier. I mean, that's a hell of a list. I'm lying about all the other people that volunteered. Okay. That makes a lot more sense. No. That, that... <laughs> no, man. Look, I always appreciate you as being one of my very first guests on the podcast. You're such a cool dude. Right now, I do want to say, for those that are watching on video, your your connection to me is choppy. So I don't know how this is going to come out, but I can hear okay. you perfectly. Okay. So, but, okay. but, but, um, no, I've always appreciated you, dude. I, I, I love your stuff. I always follow you. Where can people follow you on Instagram? Yeah, so Instagram is my only means of, of communication. I, I stay away from everything else. It's just Michael Courier BJJ on Instagram. Uh, I post technique videos, kind of day in the life stuff, uh, travel, training, all kinds of, uh, I think, interesting stuff. But um, yeah, follow along. Yes, perfect. So do that. I will put your Instagram handle, of course, in the show notes as well perfect. so people see it. Um, now, last thing I want to talk, we talked a little bit with Olga just because... Uh, Olga, uh, I just wanted to talk about with the Nganu thing. And I just thought like that Bellator, PFL, all that stuff that's going on. So I did want to get her take on it. Um, Olga was such a nice person too. Oh, uh, I couldn't even drag her into saying something terrible about people. You know what I mean? She's just such a good person. Uh, but Francis Nganu, I, I just wanted to do some final thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. So I did want to share with people what the reported some of the things that apparently are in this uh, deal. And I, yeah, I couldn't think of the name of that, that he was a fighter advocate or whatever. But um, here are some things that apparently is on his list. Uh, it is for two to three fights, guarantees a high seven figure purse for each fight, a split of the events net profits. Wow. Uh, a signing bonus or a salary to be the brand ambassador, the right to have his own sponsors in the cage, which doesn't seem to be a big deal because everybody in PFL can. Uh, right. Non-exclusive with regards to boxing. So we know the word is that he's going to box this year and go into the PFL next year. No champions clause or other extensions. We talked about this with our legal lawyer, uh, Daniel Martinez, when he was on the podcast, he explained what a champion's clause is. That's where a contract is automatically extended if you are a champion at the end of it. Uh, and then a minimum salary, possibly as high as $1 million for his opponent. That's yeah. huge, right? I mean, I, I, th I think that last thing just speaks volumes for his character. So, it, it does. Uh, but here's the thing. Michael Courier and Timmy B., are challenging Francis Ngannou. I'm putting this out there. We are both willing to fight Francis Ngannou. You know, you can go first, Mike, nope. if you want. Nope. But nope. I will, nope. for a million dollars guarantee, I will fight him and let him murder me. Uh, Listen, I have been, I have been in the same room with this man. Yeah. I was at, <laughs> I was at uh, Extreme Couture in Las Vegas, and uh, I was there for a jiu-jitsu class, and he was in, uh, he was sparring. And uh, he, there's no, there's no way. A million dollars can stay in his account or in the PFL account. I am no. happily poor. 
Um, that man will end your life without even noticing you're there. It's not even, no, no, keep it. No, no I'm fighting him. Francis Ngannou, I am challenging you to a fight 100%. Mike, here's the thing, my friend. With what all those things we just said, okay, on Twitter, I have said that this is eight easy steps to going bankrupt. Yeah. There is no freaking way that PFL can afford this and have this be sustainable. It's, I mean, and, and they have been challenged in the past about their, their business model. Dude, you know, impossible. Because, because everything about it, I mean, here's the deal. If it's true, if they can sustain this business model, if they're making this kind of, if they are, then everybody else in the business is absolute scum crooks. No, no. Right? This because is, like, no. It, it just, it's just, it's so above everything else. I mean, even, even go back a step, even saying that they're the entire season of their PFL season, the fighters are making chump change and only one guy gets a million dollars. Yeah. That's still seven or, you know, eight, eight people getting a million dollars at the end of the year. That still trumps 99% of the guys in the UFC, right? I mean, uh, yeah, it's huge. Well, did, did, I, you, did you see that kickboxing guy, Cedric Diombe or whatever, that just reported uh, what he was making? This, um, is, this is like some France kickboxer guy who apparently was signed to UFC for five seconds and then had some medical stuff, so they, they booted him out. He signed with PFL and... Uh, said 10 times. And he said 10 times. Yes. What, I mean, hopefully his math is good. But ten times what? Ten times twenty thousand? You're telling me that a guy who has four MMA fights, regardless of his kickboxing accolades, they're gonna pay him two hundred grand? Yeah. A fight that the model doesn't make sense. No, no. I mean, because I, I just don't believe that their market share is high enough no. to even come close to that. I, I love PFL. I really do. do. It, it, it's, it's super entertaining. Um, I love. I love the the, the, the the season and the postseason format. I think it's cool. I think a new champion every year is a really cool dynamic thing. I love all that they do. I don't watch it that often. No. <laughs> you know, I just look uh, we are I'm, strapped. I'm still buying pay per view. Mike, we're strapped we're strapped for time. We 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 like the the regular viewer only has so much time to allocate to watch events. Yeah. I, I watch UFC. I'll watch it from the early prelims right to the end for yeah. most cards. You know, uh, I will watch Invicta always because it's on Wednesday nights. So it's very easy. doesn't compete with anything. And then now 1FC with their Friday stuff. Okay, cool. I mean, my wife wants to murder me, right? Like, don't yeah. get me wrong. My wife is like, this is too much time. Get the hell out of here. Um, but, you know, where do I fit PFL into that schedule? Where do I fit Bellator into that schedule? Mind you, if we want to talk money, did you see Bellator now is charging me to watch in Canada? I don't know if you heard that news. It's not on YouTube anymore. I got to pay 20 bucks. Yep. Mike, I am never watching a Bellator event again. I, I'm not spending $20. No. Nope. You know? no. Uh, um, but okay, hold on. Go back to this Ngannou thing again. I, I just say there's no way this happens. I think the news in, a, in and of itself is kind of shit because... He was, you know, releasing Twitter things going, oh, big news coming on May 16th. Sure. Dude, the fact that you signed, there's no fight scheduled. Right. No date of a fight. Nothing. All he's done is sign with the organization, which as far as we all know, was the only organization offering him a deal. We yeah. know we know 1FC didn't offer him a deal. I'm pretty sure Bellator and BKFC both kind of made it assume that like the money was just out of their reach. Yeah, yeah. So PFL was your only thing, unless you were going to like, uh, like what the hell else were you going to do? Unless sure. you joined like the PGA Tour or something, like that would have been news. <laughs> That's what I want to see. That's what I want to see. Yeah. That'd like, you know, it had to be something interesting. So it wasn't really news. A lot of stuff can happen, Mike, in the next one year. Sure. He can get injured. He can get, he can retire. He can, uh, you know, blah, 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 whatever else can happen. We may well, we never know, we, see him. We saw almost the exact same thing happen in grappling with Gordon Ryan. Yeah. Right. Yep. So Gordon Ryan signed a really big deal with one that was like yep. a seven figure deal. 
Yep. And it was five fights with one or, you know, it was this big mega deal. But when he announced the deal, there was not a single fight or match on the record. He didn't have anything coming up. He never yep. fought under that organization. Yeah. Yep. He's out of the deal. Yeah. You know, and so I think that Francis needed to have come in today's announcement with a boxing match and an MMA fight already built, yeah. already kind of had posters ready to go and had this giant delivery package for us that said, hey, this is the new Nganu. This is what's happening. This is what you've all been waiting for. Yeah. But what we got is a bunch of legalese that looks good on paper, but gives us no climax. Yeah. 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 Uh, well said. Yeah. There's, there was nothing substantial there. And for all the people online that are like, this is incredible. This is great. Give me a break. These are just people, you know, whatever term you want to use, but writing, whatever, right? Like these are people that don't really see through what is really there. You're be you're being bamboozled sure. with, with stuff that is of really no relevance, which can disappear tomorrow. And the fact of the matter is, Mike, I do think, I wonder how much of this by PFL is just meant to potentially get them more investors or whatever to continue their their bleeding of money yeah. because investors well, will go, oh, if I invest with PFL now, they're the guys that have Nganu, blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, I don't know that this organization even lasts as long as before Nganu gets there. And when he does, he's going to bankrupt them. There is no... Yeah. Who is paying? I, I, I can't. I can't name you one PFL no, heavyweight. No, but but here's the deal, right? For doom, I, for doom. Right? Yeah, yeah. But so I'm I'm the PFL, right? Yeah. I, I put together this package. I say, listen, I'm gonna give Timmy this whole package deal, guarantee him millions of dollars. Let's announce that first, like you said. Let's get investors to come in, right? Yep. Because what people don't realize is none of that 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 whole eight point list, none of it's real without a fight exactly yes so that's I can what i mean promise you, yeah. i can promise you everything and then if the backers if the investors if the market doesn't grow we don't announce a fight we've lost nothing if exactly. it grows 20 yeah. percent right say if my market share grows 20 percent because of this announcement and i still can't afford to pay in ganu i don't give them a fight exactly and remember the organization always has the leverage to cancel a contract of course yes so, so they can it, just they it, can give you a contract for a billion dollars. Of course. Yeah. It doesn't matter. And then never and then never sign you a fight. And their business grows because of your name. And now Francis just got used. And maybe he gets tied up for 18 months getting promised a fight that never happened. While yeah. PFL grows, he gets mad. They cut they cut ties. PFL grows because of it. And this poor guy is stuck on the sidelines for three years. You know? So yeah. uh, a very, very valid concern if you're asking where's the money coming from yeah yeah and if you're an investor and i you know i'm yeah. not dissuading anyone from investing in pfl i guess if the head of coca-cola is watching this podcast but right. you do have to think long term like nothing solid was given not even a boxing fight right. like i can't believe that zero was laid out aside from stuff that we all had already kind of known about anyway so it's just it's a very weird announcement it's very yeah. lame you know, I mean, I'm, you can't you can't tell me there isn't a single PFL heavyweight they could have just thrown to the wolves and said, "Hey, he's fighting Tim Johnson." Here we go. Yeah, here's a oh, fight. Tim Johnson. Right. There's one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. mustache right? guy. So like, yeah, yeah. He's a, a he's a very very fun person to watch. He's got a super good personality. You know, I think obviously Ngano kills him, but we say, "Hey, here's our fight." It isn't it isn't Ngano versus John Jones, but it's here we go. We have we have this fight. And, but there, and everybody gets to win something out of it, you know? Yeah, but therein lies the problem, though, Mike. It's that um, if they did announce Nganu versus Tim Johnson, all respect to Tim Johnson, love him, you know, he's cool. Yeah, yeah. Yep. The fans would go bananas with how bullshit this is. They, yeah. would, they would say that Nganu is definitely ducking and blah, 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 and all that crap. There would be a lot more negativity because they would have something to focus on, aside from sure. smart people like you and I, which see through all the other stuff. Exactly. The problem is, he's remember, he also is signed to the, what the hell is it called? The Champion League or whatever the hell that thing was. It's something else. I'm, he's not signed to like their regular thing. He's doing that. that yes. 
that so, it's almost a super like doing, series or something. Yeah, it's, so it, it's almost like he's doing exhibition fights. Right. Right. So it's yeah, kind of how I read it. Yeah, yeah. He's not. He's not. He's not going to enter the pool for for the heavyweight championship belt. No. He's doing super fights, which you yeah. know we would call it in jiu-jitsu a super fight, wherever yeah. they're going to bring in a random guy and they're going to fight him. Yeah. Um, but I don't see him ever. You know, the way I read this, he's not fighting for the belt. No, it's him versus yeah. Manny Pacquiao. You know. Yeah. Like it's, exactly, it, it's, right? it's some bullshit like that too, which again, I don't think people understand because remember Jake Paul is in the, uh, what did I just call it? Super series? No. Yeah. Championship. Super, uh, yeah. Something. Yeah. Whatever that is. Right. Remember yeah. that's what Jake Paul is in as well. Yeah. People, people yeah. I think don't realize Jake Paul didn't sign to the regular PFL roster. He's right. in this no, no. stupid circus roster. So maybe right? we see Ngannou versus Jake Paul fine now but again who's gonna pay for that like and again there, there's, there's I, would no pay value. For that. I would i would give uh, 10 american dollars for that fight that's like a hundred canadian dollars mike so you understand my problem i can't even afford that man uh yeah i don't know there is lots of problems there i don't see anything good about it uh i i i appreciate what we said with olga which was i really appreciate and i've stuck up for francis all over the place saying no, this dude stood up for what he believed in. He stood up for his value, for his worth. Yeah. He wanted to fight for other people is what he was saying at with the UFC. And he did it because here he's doing it. So good for him. Good that he's done all that stuff for him. And I love him and, and I love what he stood for. And I hope that people copy him. But what he has accomplished with this deal is is nothing it's nothing to be excited about for the sp you know i don't know yeah. it's 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 a very confusing it, thing it is and you know like i said before with olga uh you know i so i'm a lifelong artist i've been i've been an artist my whole life i've, I've done murals and all kinds of interesting and uh, interior design and i've met artists i work with artists a lot and artists have a horrible habit of overvaluing their art yes, yes right you go to an art gallery and they want ten thousand dollars for a work of art yeah. it's not worth a hundred dollars right and so, uh, but kind of, I'm just trying to draw a parallel here. If I own an art gallery yeah. and I say, okay, I'm, I got this street artist. I'm going to give him a million dollars. And then people come into my gallery because I'm this like generous, amazing art gallery owner, but I never allow him to paint any art. Yeah. This is what's happening. Right. Yeah. Like, and so as much as I value Francis for saying, this is what I'm worth. Uh, I do think he may have overvalued himself or he had guys in his corner overvaluing him um you still have to be realistic and say do i want to fight five times for for a million dollars each or fight one time potentially for 20 million but that yeah. potential is low you know and so yeah. i think like like olga said she wants to fight i mean i'm here to fight yeah and so uh it's such a muddy line though to draw right i, mean, I know i know it's tough we're still learning yeah, no, it is tough. It's tough. And it, it's tough. Uh, you know, obviously, we're not in his shoes. And we don't know. And we don't know whether he had anybody talking to him, or whether yeah. this is just him thinking it all up. So sure. but anyways, Mike, we have gone on long. I appreciate you so much coming on this podcast, man. Like, definitely, you saved the day. You were the perfect co host for Olga wow. with the buggy choke. Uh, the perfect co-host to be able to talk to about all these things. So thank you so much, man. Uh, if people want to train from the best, a, you move to Arizona, Impact Hills, Impact Hills, Arizona. Close enough. Impact Fountain Hills. Impact Fountain Hills, Arizona. You move there first. That's that's step one. Secondly, you go find Mike Courier at his Instagram, Michael Courier. Just Michael Courier BJJ. All oh, Michael Courier BJJ. One word. Uh, right. And the the name of your gym again is Impact Jiu Jitsu. Impact Jiu Jitsu. Go find it. You are there on location. I am. I I'm mean, traveling. I said I've, I've got stops all. Actually, I'll be in Toronto in a week. Are you freaking serious? I will be in Toronto at uh, Brown's Kickboxing and MMA. I'll be teaching a seminar there on the twenty sixth. Dude, okay, we should really meet up. If I'm not, I would love that. that. Yeah. Okay. Send me the information. At least I can meet up with a coffee or something. I'd, I'd love to meet you yeah. in person. Yeah. Um, so I'll be, I'll be in, I'll be in London. I'll be in Detroit first and then London on the 25th. So London, Ontario. Yeah. And then I go from London, Ontario to Toronto 
and then Toronto to Montreal, and then Montreal on to Maine for a week. And so I'm passing through. I will have the full day on the 26th, I think it is, uh, or 25th in Toronto. So, Dude, that is so cool. Where are you in London, Ontario? Uh, a gym called Platinum MMA. Uh, okay, very cool, very cool. Uh, man, that is awesome. Well, guys, go find that. Go go find all the seminars. I mean, to meet you would be an absolute pleasure and an honor. So, guys, thank you very much. I'm going to end this podcast here. Uh, for those watching on video, I will put a couple of videos up here that will show up on the YouTube so you can click over to them. I'll put a couple that maybe we mentioned during the show today. I'll put the one with Judge Mike Bell for sure so people can hit that up. People don't realize I interviewed a judge, Mike. That's huge. It, it was huge because he told us stuff that you freaking never know. Uh, it's actually pretty hard to get a hold of, for sure. Yeah, and actually Judge Mike Bell has become a friend as well, so I do really appreciate him. He's a cool dude. I should have him back on again, actually. I should have him on soon. Um, yeah. Guys, thank you so much. Is there anything that you want to say before we uh, sign off here, my friend? No, man. Just thank you guys so much for your time. I, I, I love being here. Yeah, you're the best, dude. You're the best, and I can't wait to see you soon. This is crazy. Yeah, of course. Yeah. All right. Guys, have a good one. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye-bye.